It bombed extremely quickly as well. Like, shockingly and embarrassingly quickly. I don't... I think it was maybe too much of a peek behind the curtain. Hey, welcome to Behind the Experience, where you get an inside look behind the product experiences of the top product-like companies like Canva, Miro, Wistia, and more. This is one of your co-hosts, Family John, and I'm excited to be digging in to share with you ex- inspiring UX, hard-earned lessons, and proven frameworks from experts in product, customer success, marketing, and also sales. And really, in this episode, this very first episode of this show, I have AppQ's expert, Lila Rosell. She does our onboarding here at AppQ's, and she is also going to be one of my co-hosts. Right now, we're going to be digging into one simple technique that she applied to improve our completion rate for checklists at AppQ's from 2% all the way to 25%. Anyway, let's jump in and listen in our conversation of this very first episode. Yeah, so I'm very excited. When you said examples, uh, my heart fluttered a little bit. I'm really excited for the examples part of uh, this show. I'm excited to guide people through them and uh, kick it off talking about myself a little bit, because if y'all don't know, I am running some onboarding programs at AppQs. I've been an AppQs customer for a couple of years where I've worked on onboarding programs, product marketing, all kinds of stuff. I've run through AppQs customer marketing. So I am super excited to come with my marketing perspective to talk about onboarding and assisting, you know, with self-serve, free trial, freemium. I've done it all. So I'm very excited. <clears throat> yeah, same here. I'm like you, totally right. I think I wouldn't say I'm like as excited, even more excited than you. Like we're both nerds. I think when you nerd about onboarding and really good UX stuff, um, every, everybody can nerd out as equal. A little bit about my background. <laughs> um, Thank you for that equal. We can all nerd out equally, <laughs> PSA. That's very inclusive. Thank you. That's true. Uh, <laughs> Just a little bit about my background. Yeah, I, I'm also have been doing helping companies with, with onboarding experiences. I wrote the book Product Led Onboarding with Wes Bush, and you know I've I just I'm with you. I think there's something exciting about seeing examples from other folks and really like yeah. inspiring your own and seeing like cool new stuff that they're doing for their own experience. Because you know user engagement and product adoption, it's not it's not that easy. I think people these days are very impatient and. You know, we got to do what we can to to help guide users to the product's value. And that's what we're really all about with this with this show. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really excited, too, because I think a lot of times the folks who get the limelight or the folks who are sharing a lot of what they're working on are the leaders in an organization, whereas I think we're going to have an opportunity to talk to leaders, individual contributors, folks from across the spectrum, folks who are actually going in and building things, which is I'm one of those. Um, So I really like hearing from other people like me. So that's one other thing I'm really looking forward to is just having a wide array of guests and not just talking to leaders who don't know what it's like to actually be doing it still hoping for those conversion numbers and tweaking things and all of that fun stuff so i'm excited for that i think that's a perfect segue uh while we're like i said we're going to be interviewing folks from different companies like hotjar like typeform webflow different i think it's worth talking about app because you've been really owning that piece in app uh for app cues maybe you can just talk a little bit about you know about how you got started uh with with uh you know what's was there anything with AppKeys onboarding beforehand when you came in and, you know, like what was some of this early stuff that you started working on when you came on board? Yeah. So as you can imagine, uh, I was an AppKeys customer for two years and, and started in February of 2019 using AppKeys. Before that, I'd been using an app messaging tool since 2017. So, um, I felt like I had a lot of uh, pressure on my shoulders coming into my role. My title when I started was kind of senior growth manager, and we were going to do figure out what was what what I was good at, figure out where I was going to go, and um, 
So I was really heavily focused on when I joined, like kind of shaping up what we call at AppQs A4A, which is AppQs for AppQs. It's our little internal uh, nomenclature because as I started working here, you realize it does get confusing when you just say AppQs because that could mean so many things when you work at AppQs. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it it's it was a unique challenge that I also faced at Litmus, which is your marketing to marketers or your speaking to the people that you are in also one of, a part of. So um, it feels like a lot of extra pressure because you want to, with every piece of content, both inspire um, and provide like the best example possible. Um, so coming in with that lens, I didn't want to come in like I might in other organizations where I just start throwing stuff at the wall in a way, trying things, talking to customers um, and being a little bit more experimental because of that you know, unique factor with AppQs where what we do for onboarding is going to be an example. Um, and I want to be really cautious of that <laughs> and not go off the rails on something <laughs> that, you know, I, I haven't proved out yet or that isn't like uh, fully um, decided on as a team. A lot of times I've owned AppQs accounts and I've kind of felt comfortable just going in and changing this, changing that, kind of uh, making tweaks as I go because it's been my baby. Um, but I've worked a lot. I've built a lot more cross-functional um, work here. And that's kind of how I started thinking about it. We're, we're going to get into the, the whole cross-functional piece in, into that. But I think people, I'm always curious to hear what success looked like for the initial experience for new users. And I'm curious what that is for AppQs, like how you've, you know, or the team has defined what, what is that first win for, for new users of AppQs? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is something that has evolved a lot over the years and certainly not um, something that I was involved in the whole time. And it was really interesting to go back and kind of research where the team had tried, what conclusions they came to so that I wasn't redoing things and coming up with ideas that had already kind of been tested or uh, rabbit holes that had already been gone down. Um, so we have settled on, and if you've used AppQs before, um, that creating a flow is basically what success looks like. And a flow is, a, you know, an experience in AppQs that you would build. So there were a variety, uh, you know, the, the value of AppQs is always centered around flows. So it's not like it was, oh, they added a user or something a few years ago, but it's always been around flows. But I think the actual moment in time has experimented and changed over the years. Um, you know, it was at first aligned with, well, maybe it's publishing a flow because when you're publishing a flow, that's when you're actually like putting it out there to your users and your product for them to see. So when you start to see the interaction, that's more when you find the value. But I think we kind of found out that's a little bit farther down the line. You right. can find the value just by creating the flow and seeing how easy it is to do on top of your product. Um, so that is what we consider success that app is when you've gone in you've had a chance to try out the builder build your flow and you go oh all right like this makes sense this is easy i can do this you know i like i really like that um because you know like we're gonna jump and talk a little bit about the, that experience for new users like there is no drive in the beginning to try to install install that snippet like it, yep. I think a lot of apps that especially B2B that requires you to install that, that's the meaning like, Hey, install this and install, install this. But like, that could be a huge friction point to, yes. to get that code into that and in, into, into production. So I think it's really the, the whole drive in that new user experience is to create your first flow. And, and to your point, like realizing how easy it is to create a flow. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that I'm working on as well with onboarding and something that I really leaned into when I was at Jazz um, back in the day is telling that story about what it is that your product does, like right. telling, trying to turn the steps that people take to get started with your product into some sort of story. Um, like, you know, right now I only have this reflected in the trial emails and a couple of different flows, but... I'm moving towards the path of 
uh, getting people to build a flow, track an event, and then create a goal so that folks understand what building a flow is, how that connects to product analytics and usage. And then the goal is like the impact portion of that. So I just like talk through that in my trial emails and try and I'm trying that messaging and it seems to be really working in the emails. And um, so I'm trying to move the onboarding in that direction. Like, you know, even if there's a million different ways that you could start with a product, I think this gets, this happens a lot where people are like, oh, well, people could do this. They could do this. Right. They don't have to do it that way. And it's like, right. And those people will do it their own way. But the people who are new to whatever you're doing and need the marketing help to figure out like how to get there, they're the ones who will resonate with the storytelling. Like not everyone's going to need that. And certainly not the you who already knows how to use your product. <laughs> Um, that makes a ton of sense. I, I love that, um, that, you know, that drive and that change in, in, in messaging. I want to talk and jump a little bit about what you mentioned earlier on the cross-functional piece. Like, yeah. I think I think that's a super important thing for people to realize that improving you, user experience is not a designer thing, is not a product thing, is not just like a marketing thing. It's, it needs to be cross-functional. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how you've been working with other uh, teams in, in AppCuse to provide that really great, really good UX, so to speak. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So this was something I was super concerned with, obviously, joining AppQs. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody had insight into what I was doing because, you know, I, we can all learn from each other. And I'm hoping to provide that um, what I'm doing to like the rest of our customer base through uh, our team. So we have a couple different ways that we do this. Um, when I joined, we had a whole A for A, AppQs for AppQs. I'll say that a couple times. It means AppQs for AppQs. Uh, we had a whole AppQs for AppQs committee where we were like reviewing flows. Um, and this was before I joined, really. So I kind of like eased into this. And there wasn't really anyone who was like specifically owning AppQs. It was kind of spread across multiple teams. And like uh, our marketing team was kind of the the manager more or less, but it wasn't like really owned. Um, so I came in and I was like, all right, now I'm the app cutie in charge of AppQs. So um now everyone has like one central person to kind of filter things through. Um, and we have a Slack channel that's called AppQs for AppQs. I started an AppQs for AppQs office hour where folks could, I've, I've since canceled it. I don't want to act like um, I'm still doing it when I'm not because I have since canceled it for room for something better. I'm going to improve it a bit. But um, it was a place, especially when I was like just getting started, I think it was a valuable place for um, folks to come and just ask me questions anytime. I could show them what I was working on. I had agendas to walk people through things um, and any of the changes I was making. Because in the beginning, I just did a lot of... Um, kind of cleanup and organization. I did a lot of documenting flows, which I highly recommend for cross-functional work. It's another piece of this. So there's like either a cross-functional team that you meet with regularly. There's either that that team chat or that team channel where people can like specifically discuss app queues flows. I've had that in every organization I've worked in. Um, and then also we have a request form that is accessible within these various spaces on Notion, you know, in our Slack uh, channel pinned so that if folks have ideas for flows, they go directly into our um, uh, Asana board for me to take a look at. Um, all the flows I publish, I also put into a Notion board so that everyone can see. Because um, one of the challenges with in-app messaging is actually sharing out the content. Um, I think anyone who's worked on tools like this will understand that because you have to screenshot it in some way, use a test link. And then if someone doesn't have that same plan or that user type that that flow is meant for, then they can't see it. So you have to do a lot of screenshot documentation. It's just a part of the role, I think. And it's worth it because people will actually see what you're working on. It's not like an email where it's more easily uh, shareable. So I think the documentation piece and like either in a table or in a Miro board. Um, Tom from GetResponse has done some really cool um, stuff with his Miro boards that I have shamelessly stolen. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Tom. Yeah, yeah. So those are, I, I write about this a little bit in Made With App Keys too, but I would say like those components are very key, like touch points, tracking, um, documentation. That's really how you can, those are like the little mechanisms uh, that, that really fuel the cross-functional stuff. 
and that's all to make sh- make sure that everybody is aware of the the changes that are happening. Make sure that you know they're not colliding <laughs> with each other. Each other essentially. Well, who who attend like who 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 contributes to that abkis for abkis like you know in terms of mm. ideas is, are you seeing everybody contributing are you even engineering like wh- what kind of teams who 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 are you particularly working with which teams yeah that's a great question so it's you know primarily product and customer success and sales that we work mm. with um you know sales on the trial side and then also just like making you know because if any of our flows aren't working perfectly for a demo or in any other circumstance they definitely want to make sure that those are working well and they also might need some additional stuff for trials and reaching out to prospects so um sales and then yeah customer success trying to support folks like you know beyond just onboarding which is something i really want to do more of um with not just like app cues but with uh, email as well um just supporting that kind of i think dewey and our uh and uh our adoption panel was saying like the 500 day user um at FQ's experience Dewey from Sedna shout out to Dewey uh, so I feel like I would love to uh focus on that person more so that's another tangent but um yeah so primarily customer success product sales you know like our product team is really obviously active um in our account and like a lot of times Joey uh shout out to Joey as well we'll go ahead and <laughs> build flows and then we'll kind of like workshop them together in a channel um um, and it's in like a public channel so that everybody can see, you know, what we're talking through as well, which I think is really important to have that kind of transparency um, and understanding like why certain decisions were made. Because sometimes it might be as for a specific reason that a flow is a certain way. Um, you know, it's it's a it's an art and a science about where they go and what types of things, uh, what types of patterns you use. So it's good to keep that conversation public. Yeah, I'm, I'm, what I'm really lo- love hearing from from you is like you're really like tying. You is you're not just working in solo. I think that's super important. You're like even sales is involved. I think that's super interesting for folks to hear. Like you know, sales has an input to to trial onboarding and and customer success and and obviously product and as well as, as marketing. So I'm I'm glad you're tying that all together. I want to zoom in in particularly the new user uh, flow experience here. Uh, and I'm just going to read through this so that for people who are tuning in to, through the podcast audio version of this, um, as soon as users sign up to this, uh, they see this little welcome screen that says, yeah. hey, welcome to AppQs. And mm-hmm. it's like this modal popping up with a nice GIF that's like, looks like AppQs is exploding. Get <laughs> exploding into all the patterns. <laughs> AppQs brand mark. Yeah. It's yeah. flowering. Yeah. And it, oh, yeah. You're right. It's flowering. And it just gets started with a short um tour through the types of experiences you can create let's go you've done a little bit of experimentation uh with this uh haven't you and i'm curious you know what first of all was this welcome screen there before you came on board and what kind of experiments have you ran with this particular welcome screen yeah, great question. So this has been, I, I have not, I can't take responsibility for this lovely welcome screen. This was here when I joined and it's been performing really well. So I was like, let's not mm. just tear this down just because I'm the new kid in town. Um, you know, it works. Let's not reinvent the wheel. And um, especially because uh, the collateral and like the GIFs on here are really nice. And I think to like rebuild something completely for no reason, uh, it's not my thing. So um, I, the I've run a couple experiments though to see if there's any way that I could juice, um, you know, squeeze the juice I out love of that. this. Squeeze the juice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so one thing I did on here is I did some research, both in AppQs and in Amplitude, and I figured out how much more likely you were to have success with AppQs, aka Creative Flow. Um, if you saw the tour, the whole tour, how long it took you. Um, And then I put that information in the copy at the top here. So it was something like, this tour takes about 90 seconds and you have a 57% more likelihood to like have success with that. Wow. Yeah. Something like that. (laughs) Um, It bombed. It bombed. Yeah, yeah, it bombed. Um, I it bombed extremely quickly as well, like shockingly and embarrassingly quickly. 
Um, I don't, I think it was maybe too much of a peek behind the curtain. Mm. Right. Um, maybe too much data or people kind of felt like yucky about it in some way. Interesting. Um, so that in general has kind of confirmed to me that personalization may have gone too far Interesting, and that we need to be careful and cautious about how we use our users data because they're very aware now that we're tracking them and we know everything about them um, which is good that is how it should be Um, but I'm trying to respect that now a lot more um, and just be aware of that so that that's my hypothesis for like why that didn't do so well. Um, but I'd be curious if anyone <laughs> reaches out right. and if they perhaps <laughs> saw that experiment and tried yeah, out keys right. in that time, why didn't they like it? I'd be so, so interested to know. Because for me, I would find that personally interesting, but I am a marketer. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's just my nerdy side. I don't, I don't know. Well, that's super interesting because like you expect it to do better, right? Like yeah, it's, um, you know, like personalized people talk about personalization all the time. And I would find it interesting that those, those stats, how much did it, like you said, it bombed, like, was it like a really bad bomb? Like it was like, <laughs> or was it just like, how badly was the performance of just adding that extra information in? I want to say in the 10 to 20% range of worse, um, interesting. like noticeable right away. Um, not like I was like noticeable to the point where I didn't need to like run things in the CXL AB t- calculator that I normally do. <laughs> um, I just could look at the numbers and MQs and go, oh, and never mind. Um, so I think like personalization now doesn't mean everyone has been saying this like a buzzword, but it's no longer, hey, first name, et cetera, et cetera. It's experiences based, right? It's triggered based, it's behavioral based, and it's not explicitly calling it out either, maybe. It's more subtle, like, you know, hey, we noticed, dot, dot, dot. Maybe that's doesn't, maybe it needs to be rephrased. I don't know. Really fascinating. Really, really great insights uh, with this particular World Club screen. Uh, you know, like the rest of the tour you mentioned here, um, it, it just walks you through the different types of, of experiences or, or patterns, onboarding mm-hmm. patterns, like the, here's the modal showing here. Uh, when you click on that tour, the welcome screens, there's a modal. Just make a big splash with modals with the GIF around modals moving around. And then it also shows slide outs. So like, that's another example. Uh, and then the very last one here, uh, when you click on the third pattern that people will see when they sign up for AppX for the first, first time is a tooltip. It's really interesting that if you're kind of training people already, like this is, they, they, we're using our patterns to to tell, to educate people about those particular patterns, which I find super, super inter- interesting. Do you, have, do, you, do you have any insights around this? Any experiments you've done with this? Like what, you know, it seems like a very short, like kind of like here are the different patterns tour or like, is there anything else that you've seen with this kind of, tour yeah so i agree like i had nothing this is again i just showed up and this tour was here and i was like (laughs) yeah this works for me and customers or prospects trialers they like it too it it converts very well i think we have like an over 60 percent completion rate on that um tour so it works really well i have added a couple things in here that didn't work um, I added, so if you're familiar with app cues, you know that we have a Chrome extension that you need to build. And so we have the fun challenge of getting you to both install JavaScript and download an, a Chrome extension, which are very easy things to do, but they are tasks that you must do. Um, and so I had a, um, probably well-intentioned hypothesis that, increasing the amount of Chrome extension installs will increase the amount of flows created. Um, So I put an additional modal after this tooltip that encouraged people to go install the Chrome extension. It had no effect at all um, on Chrome installs. And what I looked at was the number of Chrome installs and flow creation is one to one nearly. It's not like someone goes to create a flow 
installs the Chrome extension and then is like, eh, I don't feel like it anymore. If they're going to do it, they're going to do it. Mm. So it's not really about getting someone to install the Chrome extension. It's about getting them excited enough to create a flow. Mm. Interesting. Um, so I instead took that step and put it into the checklist, which um, mm. you can see on the bottom right. It's right. a two-step checklist that says install to get started. Right. And it's just telling folks, and if you click on install the builder, they'll be brought mm. directly to the link in the Chrome store to install the extension. So I kind of made it less of an interruptive thing that they must take care of right now when they weren't even ready yet. They didn't even like see the product or understand what the Chrome extension was and like just let that checklist hang out in the bottom right persistently for when they've had a chance to click around and then figure out again that, um, okay, I need something else to build the flow. Oh, okay, here we go. Oh, I see it's in the bottom right here. Got it. That is super, super interesting. I think that, you know, like it's a really interesting insight that it was a good hypothesis. It, people getting people to install Chrome extension would probably, you know, increase commitment so that they create a flow, but it, you found it the other way around. Like, let's get them excited first and then kind of delay that, move it out of the tour and add it to to the checklist, which is a yep. smart, smart move. The the other thing, the other thing that I find interesting with this checklist, and I, I'm I'm not sure if, if this was around before 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 you started here. It's like there's already something checked off. <laughs> I think that's mm -hmm. for me that's a great practice. Like if you're gonna show a checklist, make sure at least one thing is checked off here. It's like the thing that's checked off in the checklist is get to know the app queues patterns checked off. And then the one that's unchecked off, like you just mentioned, is install the builder. And to your point, when somebody clicks on that, gets them to install the Chrome extension. I, did you experiment at all with this checklist or is like, this is good. This is good. Best practice. Let's go for it. <laughs> no, I actually did. This is one of the things that I did overhaul is our checklist. Um, uh, so a little bit about me. I was a checklist noob uh, before coming to AppQs. I had never used them really at all. Um, I don't think that any of the other tools that I used had this feature um, out of the box. So I think that may be one reason. The other reason is um, I think that like it's a checklist is a now that I'm learning and also looking at a lot of, a lot of other customers accounts, you must use it so carefully. And I, and I, um, I'm learning that. I'm learning that. And I think that there's a lot of learning to be done around checklists. So stay tuned <laughs> for me because I want to help people that through what I've learned. Um, but her checklist when I joined was not heavily segmented at all. Um, basically almost went to everybody the same checklist. Mm. Um, and it was uh, get to know the app queues patterns. And that was checked off because that is when you viewed that tour. And if you click on it, it'll launch that tour, that same welcome mm -hmm. tour that you saw. So people have the ability to revisit it. And they do um, pretty regularly, which is interesting. Um, so I kind of thought about, uh, you know, there were and, and so in the previous checklist, there were a few different steps, there was that, uh, you know, take the tour step the get to know the mm. app cues pattern step right. there was a create a flow step and then i think a like track an event step mm. and then possibly something else i could be wrong can't quite remember they're like two to three steps so that's good i would definitely recommend keeping it like under four steps if possible um and like I, what i'm i'm still i'm learning this as well already so i have i, I still have improvements to make um but in the trial specifically um, I, well, I split it out above, uh, I split it out across uh, post-purchase and trial into two different checklists for each person. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm having a really hard time explaining explaining this. So I split it into two groups. So basically you get one checklist here for installing the builder. And then once you've installed the builder and you've, um, and you've, uh, taken the tour, it automatically com you complete that checklist, and then another checklist pops up that is create a flow, um, track an event, right. and create a goal. And it also is get to know the app keys patterns is the first thing, and it's checked off because that is best practice. And I don't want people to feel like they constantly have something to do. It's just to help them like guide through their next steps. And you know, when you click on it, you'll be taken to that part of the product with a little tour showing you how to get started. Like, but you can plug URLs in there. So um, that has increased our 
checklist completion astronomically. Um, we have like when I started, it was like less than 2% of people were completing our checklists. And now it's like 25% of people are completing checklists in the trial specifically in the post-purchase experience. It's much lower, but I think that's because there's all different types of users that are joining into a customer's, a, you know, an existing customer's account. Um, they're not necessarily all just looking to create a flow. Um, someone might be coming in to edit a flow mm. or work on a theme. Um, so we need to get a little bit more personalized um, in that sense, but not a creepy sense. I love that. So <clears throat> if I'm hearing this correctly and I just want to confirm it, it's kind of, you've split it up to two, two checklists. The first one is just yep. install the builder and the other one is, you know, the longer one and the, yeah, exactly. I'm like chaining them essentially. Mm. Um, so that folks don't have just like a 45 page to do list. Uh, they have a couple little things and then just kind of right. walking them through those, uh, little setup pieces. Interesting. So after I've installed the builder there, the next checklist would pop up with like create your flow, all that stuff. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I love that concept because it's like, <clears throat> I love comparing onboarding to like video games where like there's level one <laughs> yes. and you got to beat the level one boss. Like this yes. is the level one boss. And then once you beat the level one boss, you go to level two and then you yes. got to beat the level two boss. And I think that's a very good ap application of that concept here or like, you know, like that's options actually get more people to complete it rather than, you know, when you see a lot of options, you're like, ah, oh, it's too long. I, I want to give up. Exactly. Like that's too much. I didn't know I had to do all this, but really they're really bite-sized tasks that they, that need to happen. It's just teeny little things that you need to click on here and there. Um, so I think if you make them palatable and also understandable, this was a really good point that Jessica Andrews made from Copper about how their checklist wasn't working because they were using terms that were a little too inside baseball or a little too specific and their user base was like we don't we're not ready for that term yet we don't mm. know what an opportunity is yet so try and be super aware of that like at AppQs internally we refer to like studio and builder but when i was an AppQs customer i never once <laughs> called at AppQs Studio or Builder. <laughs> right. So, you know, it doesn't, it wouldn't make sense for me to put that in the checklist. Like take a tour of the studio. People would be like, oh, huh? Studio, the studio yeah. is just AppQs. Right. Um, right. You know, there, there's, a, there's no difference there. <laughs> right. So be very aware of the language that you're, you're using. You don't want to alienate people or make them feel like they don't belong in your product when they do. I love that. That's a really good point around using language as well. That they be, that's, yeah, I've never... When I was using, I was also an AppQs customer before. I was like, if you ask me, take a tour of the studio, I would have been like, which studio? The photo studio? Yeah, like, yeah. Studio? Like, I, I didn't know AppQs had a studio. Where's my invite? <laughs> yeah. That's no. super fun. Yeah. I want to start wrapping up and ask you what you're excited to try next. Like, is there anything that you're looking forward to trying, uh, you know, experimenting with or implementing that you um, want to share with, with the audience about? Yeah, absolutely. There's so many things. I wish I could just do that all day, honestly. Uh, you know, maybe someday I will. But um, yeah, I really would like to have more personalized onboarding um, tracks based on people's roles in the company. You know, we do collect that information when someone's added to an account. Um, so I would love to do more of that. I've also um, working on kind of different experiences and segmenting people down, not just by like who they are as a person, but are they a self-serve customer? Are they post-purchase? Are they trial? Um, are they newly added to an account? Do they have a CSM? I really want to get more um, specific with that and have more personalized like onboarding outreach for one to many folks and for our um, CSMs to get to know our customers through AppQs a little bit better. Um, that is something I'm really excited about. And then also, uh, I'm really hoping to work on some templates for AppQs. Oh, so, <laughs> uh, that would be really exciting. That's something I'm, I'm investigating right now and figuring out how we could possibly do that. So, um, that's something I'm really excited about because I think it's a big need. A hundred percent. I think that would really speed things up. Like people can just apply this new user, um, template or this, you know, and an NPS template. So I think that'll be re it, really, really cool to see. Yep. Yep. I'm really excited that. And I'd love to base it on 
and people inspired by this community, you know, inspired by the mm. really good UX community. So someone could build, you know, Copper's onboarding flow or something like that. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, people inspire me. <laughs> I love it. It's we're all about inspiring here. Uh, yeah. uh, really awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Lila. We're super excited. I, I mean, that hopefully that gave people a taste of what this show is about. Like I said, this is exactly what we're going to be doing and like talking to people from, like you said, copper and get response and Webflow and as many companies as we can to kind of see the behind the the scenes things that are is happening to improve. UX and onboarding experiences and flow. So I'm super excited. Hopefully, Lada, you're super excited as well. Are you kidding me, Ramla? <laughs> Do you know who you're talking to? Of course I'm excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. If anyone wants to be on the show, contact me or Ramly. I mean, if you don't know where to find us, I don't know what's wrong with you. We both have very, <laughs> I think, unique names. We should we're not yeah. like John Smith and um, you know, Mary Poppins. So uh find <laughs> us. It. If you want to be on, we want to have you on. Uh, doesn't matter what experience you've had. If you've never talked before, if you have talked before, I feel like I need to make that disclaimer because we want to talk to everybody. <laughs> yes, I totally agree with you. Reach out to us on LinkedIn. Um, we're both there. You probably can just type Lila and then Ramley and we'll probably be the first one to show up. Yeah, if you type Apkis. Lila or onboarding, <laughs> or Ramley onboarding, Lila Abkey is Ramley right. Abkey. Is, there's, there's no way you won't find us. It's disturbing probably. That's true. So we do want to talk to you if you work on onboarding or UX or improving flows. We'd love to hear from you. And if, if you're tuning in as well, make sure to subscribe to wherever you get your podcast shows as well as uh, we're, we're, we're also on YouTube. So make sure to subscribe to the Abkey's YouTube channel. And smash that like button. Smash that like button. <laughs> and please leave a review if you're an Apple podcast. <laughs> yeah. Leave a review. Smash the like button. Do all of the things that podcasters tell you to do. <laughs> awesome, Mala. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Woohoo. Thanks, Ramley. All right. See you all later.